Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We will get started in just a couple of minutes. All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Survive and Thrive, How to Recession Proof Your Business. I am Brenna Whitaker. I'm going to be your host for today's webinar, and due to a last second scheduling change, I will also be one of your panelists as well. So we have a lot of information to cover today, so we are going to jump right in, starting with introductions. So I am thrilled to introduce our other panelists today, starting with Peter Dunn. AKA Pete the Planner. Pete is an award winning financial expert. He's a USA Today columnist, the author of 10 books, and the CEO and founder of Your Money Line. Pete is also the host of a popular radio show and podcast, The Pete the Planner Show. And he appears regularly on TV and nationally syndicated radio programs. Pete is regularly considered one of the foremost experts on financial wellness, and we are thrilled to have him as part of our webinar today. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Pete. Good to be here. And Tom Gabbert. Tom has been a pioneer and thought leader in the outsourced accounting industry since 2003. He's a successful entrepreneur who loves helping fellow entrepreneurs realize their dreams. Tom has worked with hundreds of clients over the years and understands the unique challenges of starting, growing, and exiting a business. So welcome, Tom. Thanks, Brenna. Good to be here. And now, Pete, I'm going to kick it over to you and let you work a little early and let you introduce me. <laughs> Absolutely. Of course, it's no fun to read your own bio. So I, right? I volunteered for this. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with 18 years of human resources experience, including both corporate and consulting roles, Brenna is a seasoned people ops leader. And as a co-founder of Milestone, she has funneled a passion for creating high impact HR initiatives into her work with small to mid-sized businesses across the country, helping them to develop a strong organizational culture and next level employee experience. Your host, Brenna Whitaker, <laughs> and panelists, and panelists. Thank you. It's it's nice and not awkward at all to just sit here and listen to someone read nice things about you. So thank you, Pete. All right. Well, as we said, we have a lot to cover today. So we are going to jump right in. Uh, for the format of today's webinar, we thought we're going to start with survive. Let's talk about some of the foundational elements a person, a business should consider when we are facing that economic downturn. Then we're going to look at thrive. How can we take a difficult situation, take a recession, and turn that into an opportunity? So to get things started, Tom, we are going to start with you. So what would you say, what are these foundational things a business should think of? when the economy starts to slow down to ensure that it's going to be able to survive the downturn, where should a business even begin? 
Yeah, great question. There's a lot here. I could probably dominate the website with this question alone, but I'm not <laughs> going to do that. So cut me off if I go too deep on it. But um, I think it often starts with having a great plan, right? Every business owner should have a contingency plan in place in good times or bad. Um, but especially when we're in a turbulent economy like we are, you don't want to be caught flat-footed. So the businesses that survive and thrive uh, during tough times are proactive. So I'm a big fan of what I call trigger-based contingency plans. So by that, I mean a detailed plan that outlines the actions that you take if certain triggers are met. So for example, if, if revenue drops by 10%, I'm going to do these things. If our revenue continues to drop and we're down 25%, I'm going to do these things. So that's that's what I mean by a trigger-based plan. Um, and you need to you need to identify the triggers that should that make sense for your business. Um, I've just mentioned revenue, but it, often revenue is a lagging indicator. And so I, I look for leading indicators whenever possible. So, for example, um, if our lead flow drops by 25 percent or our close cycle extends by 50 percent, things that tell you that you're about to hit a revenue skid, that things are about to slow down, get in front of it, right? So that's that's mm -hmm. the, the first thing that like have a trigger-based contingency plan. So as you're thinking about, okay, what are those things I'm gonna do? The first place to start is expenses, right? It's the obvious one that everybody thinks about that may seem you know fairly straightforward, but there's some nuances to it that I, that I uh, advise my clients. So start with the people list. So create a forced ranking. Uh, and I know this is hard from your most valuable to your least valuable. This is this is a difficult exercise, but I believe it's a healthy thing to do. Um, and again, regardless, good times or bad, you should probably be doing this. Most companies um, have individuals at some level that aren't performing. They're not hitting expectations. Um, this exercise is going to help you to identify that and take action, you know, um, and then, you know, so you got the people issues. And then beyond that, you look at fixed expenses. So the fixed expenses are your expenses that um, recur every month. They're somewhat predictable. You should look at those and put them into three categories is um, how I look at it. So expenses that you should be cutting right now, um, regardless, right? These are, and we all have it, right? If you go look at your expenses, um, I've done this myself. We've been through it with clients. There's always some aha moments when you get in there and you start looking at your expenses. There's those business apps that you don't use anymore, the license fees that you have for somebody that left the company two years ago. There's always stuff that you should be cleaning out. So there's that first category, cut the expenses that just make sense. And then the second category is uh, expenses that could be cut. They're nice to have, but maybe not required. This is where it gets harder, right? And prioritize that list. And then finally, it's expenses that are critical to the business that you don't cut, right? So I put them into the three buckets and focus on that middle category. And that's where the work gets done. Um, and then there's variable expenses. I mean, you should be looking at um, your... Things like um, supply supply contracts, material contracts, things that could be maybe renegotiated um, and with an opportunity to reduce expenses. And then all of this comes together. And, and I, I will stop talking here to Brenda, Brenda in a minute. I know <laughs> I, can, I could keep going here, but all of this comes together in a financial forecast, right? At the end of the day, I believe every business owner needs to have a forecast um, so that they can they they can make changes like this. They can do some sensitivity analysis, and they can understand how these things impact profitability and cash flow, right? Um, and at the end of the day, cash flow is the single most important thing that we need to be looking at. Uh, and your forecast is going to help you do that. And then the final thing, I'm going to tee it up for you, Brenna, on the HR side. Yeah. The final thing I think you need to be thinking about is your people, right? So yeah make sure you're communicating with your team in a transparent way. So remember, if, if you're feeling anxious about the economy and you're uncertain, your, your people are too, right? So talk to them. Transparency is your friend. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just being able to acknowledge those, those feelings that everyone is having uh, goes a long way, especially during a time that people might not be feeling really connected. It can certainly help. So yeah, we'll touch on that a bit more in a minute, but I want to hear... Um, but Tom, that's great. I, I feel like there's, I need to hear that several more times to be able to get, get everything that you went through, the, a lot of great information there. Um, Pete, let's, let's talk about the personal approach. So, you know, speaking of, with the, the personal finances in mind, what is the first thing you would recommend an individual do just to ensure that they're in a position to, to weather a potential recession? Yeah, oddly enough, they, they want to check their tolerance. So this is a little bit of a wacky concept, uh, but yeah. stick with me and you'll get something from it, I promise. So 
I'm of the belief that when we do something that we shouldn't do financially, that most people over time choose to just get more comfortable with that bad decision. In other words, they increase their tolerance over time. So if let's say you have the wrong amount of life insurance and, and, and so you're okay with it, what ends up happening is you get more okay with it. And now you've told yourself the story that it's, it's fine. Well, no, it was never fine. You were wrong. And you've just convinced yourself you're fine. And, and when you get into a scenario in which times look like they could be tough, like there's headwinds ahead. I want people to check their tolerance. I want them to say, what deficiencies have I now accepted is okay. Because mm-hmm. when the economy tightens up, and even if you're a successful salesperson or business owner, and your power is generating money, generating income to solve all of these problems, uh, that becomes much harder during a recession. So it's a matter of, just like Tom said, it's you know putting a plan together. But I think people tend to feel their stability as opposed to prove their stability. And, and so for, for me, I like to to look at emergency funds, obviously. I like to look at, do we think actual household income is gonna come down by 25% or more? I think one of the most important things is what percentage of my income is fixed versus variable? A lot of people love the idea of variable incomes pushing us in our goals and our endeavors. However, certainly a lot easier to budget when you know exactly what's coming in. Uh, And then finally, debt levels. I mean, sometimes our debt levels are are being tied to our past is what prevents us from living the present that we want and the the future we dream about. So I guess I'm saying is it's all the feel good's got to go and it's got to get down to, you got to step on the scale and see what's really going on and quit misrepresenting the truth to yourself. Yeah, Yeah. that's, that's great. Uh, So tell me, you know, understanding that people come from all you know, just varying degrees of financial understanding, financial stability. Is there a way that you would customize that advice given someone's, whether it's where they currently are or just their general knowledge level on the topic? Yeah, I think sometimes the the biggest uh, blind spot for people are people who have a lot of money, earn a lot of money, or are very educated. I, I think they're more susceptible to financial mistakes because you've always been able to figure something out. I think the, mm-hmm. the most pragmatic example of that is, let's say you get to your kid ends up being 17 or 18 years old, and, and it's time to figure out the college education, and you haven't planned, and you simply say, uh, we'll figure it out. And fast <laughs> forward five, six years, and figuring it out is actually pretty ugly. You've made a lot of terrible mistakes yeah. based on your faith and your decision-making ability. So that's an element to it. And, you know, Brent, as we, as we start to talk here about as an employer, how do you think about your employees financial lives? Another element of this too is, look, I happen to be good at personal finance. My behavior is good there. There are several other areas of my life in which my behavior is not as reliable. And so looking through that other lens, whether it be nutrition or fitness or faith or relationships or whatever, and saying, what do I struggle with? Because if I think about that, I'm going to be better able to understand someone who's struggling financially. Yeah, that's that's great. And just understanding that that you're right, there's a lot of different things that contribute to our overall overall wellness. And this is certainly one of them, but it's one piece of of a much larger larger puzzle. So, Pete, I want to stay with you for a second as as a business owner with obviously who has a, an interest in in personal financial health. What responsibility do you think if any, a business has to help their employees in a time of recession, where is that intersection between personal and business financial health? So I've been doing this a long time, Brenna, and I I have to say at one point, altruism was the motivation. It was like, Mm -hmm. hey, it's the right thing to do. And, you know, whether you call your team a family or a team, I choose team, other people choose family. I'll let you sort (laughs) that out yourself. Um, I, I think it's more pragmatic than that. I think your people's financial ills end up being your problem as a business owner. And, mm-hmm. and I, I, I say that with respect and I, I try to say that appropriately. Um, I, I'm just very concerned at times when a person buys a house they shouldn't if they're a, a coworker mm-hmm. of mine or they find themselves spending too much 
on consumer goods, or they're not saving for retirement, or they don't have a rainy day fund, that impacts mm -hmm. their productivity. They are more likely to leave and find another job, and which can create massive turnover issues. And when it comes to discernment, this idea that a person may be so stressed and, and, and needing money so bad that they're not going to have the best judgment, that yeah. scares that scares me, especially when it comes to an executive leadership team. Absolutely. I, you know, I think this is really interesting because there, there have been so many different approaches to this over the years. There's the, your work life is very separate from your home life approach, right? Then there's bring your full self to work. There, there's just a lot of different ways to approach it. And I think that ultimately we need to view team members holistically, that they, they are people, right? They exist outside of the nine to five work that they're doing for your organization. And I also think the increase in remote work has just continued to to blur those lines right it's it becomes harder to separate personal from from professional work from home when you know it's happening all the time all in the same place so i, I just think you know to, to sort of piggyback on what you said a business leader cannot ignore what's going on with their their team members um when employees are feeling heightened stress feeling that anxiety um, when they don't have that stress, they're able to feel more focused. They're going to be more productive, more balanced. It truly is, is beneficial across the board. Now, Pete, you can tell me if this is, doesn't ring true. I was just looking into a few things prior to this. I saw a survey that said 78% of employees say they're distracted by their personal finances while they're at work. That is not an insignificant amount of time that you can gain back as, as an employer when you have something in place that can that can help to reduce that stress that your team members are feeling. I 100% believe the 78% statistic. And here's why. Uh, I, I have some means and I have the ability and the wherewithal to deal with financial problems. Yet my own personal finance challenges, whether it be a blip in insurance coverage or something like that, causes a, a time suck. Hey, yeah. here's, here's one more, more even pertinent. We had a team member here in the last week that had a fire at her apartment complex and oh had goodness. numerous items ruined. If she didn't know to have renter's coverage, mm -hmm. then her problem and distraction would be much worse. She knew to have yeah. renter's coverage. Now I like to think it's because she works at your money line, but she did. And so that distraction will be much less. So it's, yeah. it can, you know, it can be all sorts on that spectrum. Man, absolutely. I, you know, I, I do think one area of this that can be a little complex is that balance between employee support and employee privacy, right? Finances tend to be a very private uh, topic. It's not something that, that, that we're raised to speak about. We don't talk about it, right? So tell me where this line is. And, and Pete, how have you observed companies that are really walking this line and doing it well? Yeah, it's a challenge, right? And we get the confidentiality <laughs> question all the time. And um, I think it comes with transparency through operations, right? It's it's if you are going to be transparent about the business's finances in an appropriate way, then you can expect some level of reciprocation that the person will take what you have to say and, and do something with it. Um, sometimes when we go to implement with a company, and if the company culture isn't transparent, if the company culture isn't paternalistic, or we shall also say maternalistic, then then what we're doing doesn't make sense for that company and the employees won't listen. They won't engage because they find it so out of character. So I think it yeah. really is about the culture that allows that. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll close with this sort of idea here. For years, we've talked about employee engagement, which is to, on some level to get employees to care deeply about the company's corporate and financial goals. I believe there's another side of that, which is employer engagement, and that is caring mm -hmm. deeply about the personal goals of the people. And I, I think you can feel that in the right organization. Yeah, absolutely. I think just something that resonates with me is it, you know, thinking of always wanting to leave people better than you found them, right? That if someone is with your organization for a set amount of time and then they move on, they have a better opportunity that's okay. As long as we are able to look and say, we are, are helping this person to be in a better position when they leave than what they were when the day they, they came in the door, because 
wouldn't you hope that their previous employer did the same, right? And that their next employer did the same. And just imagine, you know, that the condition our workforce could be in if all employers were looking at their team, at their workforce with that perspective, right? So, Tom, I want to I want to say, you know, take this back to you and, and tell me, what would you say to a business owner, a CEO, a CFO who, you know, they're just looking at the budget and they say, look, we just, we don't have the room to do anything. We can't do anything to provide additional support for our team. You know, it's, it's easy to say that, but I would tell you that's short-sighted thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you run a business that's highly dependent on people and your people are the key to your success, and let's be honest, almost every business falls into that category, right? You, yeah. you have to prioritize your team. Um, and that means you got to think outside the box when it comes to allocating resources and you got to make some hard decisions. Um, so we talked about reviewing expenses a few minutes ago and looking for ways to cut unnecessary spending. This same exercise, I believe, will help you as you look to reallocate available funds in order to create a people first business. Yeah, I, I love that. I and I think that there are a lot of cost effective options. There are tactics that business can employ to help that you don't have to, to break the bank, like obviously doing an across the board pay increase for everyone to help um, counteract the, the inflation and the cost of living, that's great, but that's not practical uh, for a lot of businesses. So I think there are other things that a, that a company can look into that a business could try. Things like dependent care, FSA, childcare is extremely expensive. So giving your team a, a vehicle for pre-tax childcare funds uh, can be a great benefit for team members who are in that stage of life. A small contribution, reimbursement programs can certainly go, go a long way. Um, I think there's some other things that that can be cost effective for businesses like flexible schedules, hybrid or remote work um, for companies that don't have that to consider even just saving gas money, eating at home. I know I save so much money on lunches just on those days that I choose to, to work from home. Uh, and of course, EAPs, tools like your money line, these are, are obviously great benefits that, that can be rolled out for the team. I would want to add in here, and this is me sliding into panelist mode instead of host, host mode. Um, if you do have a budget, I'd highly recommend that you think about implementing a survey to really determine what your team is going to value so that you can align your benefit programs accordingly. Uh, when money is tight, it's really important um, that you make sure the funds that anything you have designated for employee be benefits, for wellness, that they really are going to reach their target. They're going to, to make an impact. We surveyed our team here at Milestone recently just to find out um, what they would be the most interested in. And for our team, financial wellness came back as an area that was really high um, had a lot of interest. For us, that was a great data point and the last thing that, that we needed to see to justify rolling out your money line as a benefit for the team at Milestone. I would also say too, um, make sure that your team members are aware of the benefits that are already available to them. Do you have an HSA? Do you have a retirement plan that you offer? Do you have matching for any of those? Do you already offer dependent care FSA? Start by making sure that your team members are aware of benefits that are already there. They know how to take advantage of them. It is something that we see, unfortunately, quite often um, for a company to spend the time, the energy, or the money working on an initiative, setting up a program, paying monthly fees for something, and then they don't have the ongoing support. They don't have the ongoing communication. And over time, everyone just sort of forgets that it's there. Um, I think that can be a really good, great place to start if funds are, are limited. Just make sure you're taking advantage of the things that you already have, have in place. So before we switch gears and start talking about the, the Thrive element here, um, Pete, is there anything else that you can think of that we haven't already addressed just related to ways that companies are able to benefit, this mutually beneficial relationship that we can have when it comes to um, when it comes to personal financial health for it, uh, employees. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting line and sometimes a fine line, Brenna. The, this idea, if, a, if the leadership team can go to everyone and appropriately say, look, this is a business. We are in a business to, to change lives, to serve people, but we are here to, to financially benefit. Uh, and if you can honestly and authentically say, and we want you to benefit too. And here's <laughs> yeah. what that looks like. You know, I, we do a lot with school systems and uh, not to get on a weird track here, but 
I feel like school systems have lost the narrative because here's the right narrative for a first year teacher. Hey, okay, we want you to teach here at this school district and here's why. We are gonna help take care of your student loans via public service loan forgiveness. We're gonna give you the means to problem solve whatever's going on in your financial life right now. And based on the state in which you live, your retirement will be taken care of forever. So if you can commit to being part of our community, we're gonna to commit to giving you a brilliant financial life. That's the narrative. Yeah. Instead, it's 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 gotten completely lost. And so yeah. each business has that opportunity to do something similar. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that approach because it is holistic. Like we've talked, I mean, it's looking at more than just, this is your job, this is what you're gonna do, and this is what we're gonna pay you for that, right? But it also, it, it's setting employees up for the long-term from day one, um, helping to build that long-term relationship between the employee and the employer. I love that. All right, so we, we, we've talked about how we are going to survive this. Let's switch gears and talk about the Thrive component. So sometimes beyond the foundation, a company might want to level up during the recession, right? Take, take this and, and put it to their advantage. So Tom, let's start with, with you. Let's talk about what can a business do to really get ahead during a recession? And is that even possible? Yeah, no, I love this. Actually, I'm I'm a glasses half full person. I mean, I tend to be pretty optimistic, and I don't believe it's all doom and gloom, right? I actually believe that savvy business owners look for and find opportunities in the midst of chaos, uh, especially a chaos that a recession brings. Uh, you know, we we launched Milestone in June of 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong, right? And and in a weird way, it put wind at our back. So uh, you know, I uh, I am you know truly a positive person when it comes to this stuff. So I, I think that, you know, in terms of looking at opportunities, you need to be asking yourself some questions like, you know, can I provide a new product or service offering that will resonate in tough times? Mm. You know, or, or can I make a strategic acquisition that will put me ahead, uh, that will make a big difference? It could be a great time to buy, right? You should be, you should be looking at that. Um, should I start a business? And I, I read an article recently, this was this was fascinating, actually, that, that suggests that a recession is a great time to start a business. And it pointed out that over half of the Fortune 500 companies were started during a recession. And if you look wow. back, at, yeah, it's, it, that was that was a mind blower for me. You, you look back at the last recession in 08, the last significant recession in, in 2008, Uber, Slack, Warby Parker, Airbnb were all started in, in the middle of the recession. Mm -hmm. So that's, if you want some headlines, there they are. Um, you know, and I think that there's a number of reasons why it makes sense to start a business during a recession. First of all, there's going to be less competition. You know, that's that's one thing to look at. Also, I think we'll you'll have better access to talent. There's more people looking for jobs. It's going to be easier to find people. Um, in the current economy, I believe that VCs still have money, you know, so that's Maybe not true in every recession, but in this one, there's still money out there. Uh, VCs are looking to invest, so capital is available. Um, and then I think if if you come up with the right idea, it's easier to acquire customers if if you know if you nail it, if you pick the right product. So anyway, those are yeah. some things I look at. I think that there's lots of opportunity in the middle of a an economic downturn. Yeah. So. Tom, and in talking about the types of industries or businesses that are really going to see growth during the recession, uh, would you say that that's really the, the businesses that are able to identify that, understand that things change, identify what that means in the marketplace, and then really cater to it? Yeah, I, I think that's part of it, right? I think, and I, I look at it in terms of like maybe two categories in terms of industries that I, I think do well in the recession. So when you're looking at B2C, so folks that sell to consumers, um, you know, things like, you know, healthcare and consumer staples like groceries and alcohol is one that always do does well, <laughs> um, you know, discount retailers, hardware stores, do it yourself suppliers, those, those kind of businesses do really well in economic downturns. Um, and then when it, when you think about businesses, um, IT, IT security, things that you can't do without, right. They're not optional accountants, you know, I'm glad to put us yeah. in that category. <laughs> Good times are bad. You need accountants and, um, you know, I think also industries that solve problems and what you should look for as a business owner is new problems that have been caused mm -hmm. by the recession in ways that you can help. So, yeah. you know, it maybe sound like a commercial for us. It's not meant to, but fractional providers, companies like Milestone that do fractional services, sure. we do accounting and HR, but 
Um, there are there are a lot of others out there too that you know you can do. You can maybe get the same function covered, uh, get the expertise you need in a more cost effective model. So anyway, there's there's a lot of industries that do well when times get tough. Yeah, yeah. So. Pete, let's talk about this at the individual level. Can a person actually come out ahead? Can they use this economic downturn to their advantage? One of my favorite facts of the pandemic, which I, I don't say that glibly, like I understand it's a horrible time, but there are silver linings that have developed sure. in many cultural aspects. And here's one of them. 2020 was one of the finest financial decision-making years ever. People were so... <laughs> so shocked into positive decision making that it changed their <laughs> lives in a great yeah. way. So here's what's weird. Naturally, the pent up consumer demand and the uh, availability of government stimulus had people go wild in 2021, which led to uh, what 2022 is, is a pretty, pretty gross year financially. And here's what I'm bringing all this up. If there is a recession on the horizon or if we're in one now, it's not going to feel like the light switch being flipped off on March 12th, 2020, like it felt like then. It's going to feel much more mm -hmm. gradual. So if you can have the awareness to say, okay, it is time to, just like as Tom said earlier, like with fixed expenses, what can go, what maybe needs to stay and what has to stay, you can do this the same sort of thing. And I don't want my advice here to be especially for business owners. I don't want it to be, well, hey, the gig economy can help you. You can drive Uber, <laughs> deliver DoorDash. That's not the direction, but it's the same mentality yeah. of, okay, well, everyone's licking their wounds. Let's go. And I think personal finance wise, the easy answer is buy low and sell high. If the stock market's <laughs> depressed, jump in with your dry powder, but it's not always that easy, but you can jump in with your business. Just like uh, just like Tom said, if if there's an angle or a problem you're trying to solve, this is the time. And for business owners like me, um, sometimes you have to look at the capital available and say, you know what? I'm betting on myself. Forget mm -hmm. this blue chip stock. I'm I'm betting on myself. I'm investing in my business. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's the best personal finance answer. Yeah, I I love that. Um, you know, and and I think just to kind of continue from that in looking at this from the team perspective it's also an opportunity to demonstrate transparency to your team right it's it's an opportunity for your your employees to recognize that you have made that effort to be upfront with them that you are trying to be customized and specific with your support um, with the initiatives you're putting in place it gives you the chance to show that we are putting people first and we want to work with you to find creative solutions, right? You have an opportunity to create engagement, to demonstrate your own engagement with your team, and to, as a result, build loyalty on both sides. Um, I think that's that's one positive out of an economic downturn is it allows you to show your team that you truly do value them. I would say that's something we should strive for all the time, but I think it's a little easier to do that when you know, you're having your best sales months you've ever had. Great. Let's, let's do some, something extra for our team, but being able to show that same level of, com of commitment, support, creativity, when things are difficult, I, I think it allows you to show your character uh, as an organization. So it just gives you a, a unique opportunity. All right. So one question, I want to make sure we leave time to get to some of the submitted questions. So one, one question before we get to that, what is one piece of advice that you would give to a business owner who is feeling anxious right now? They, they see some things that might be coming, coming their way and they're just starting to feel anxious over the, the possibility of a recession. What is that one piece of advice that you would give? Tom, let's start with you. Okay, you know, I'm gonna double down on something I, I, I talked about earlier. You have to invest the time to do the, the contingency plan, the trigger-based contingency plan that I mentioned. Hopefully you don't ever have to execute it, but I will tell you the peace of mind that you get from doing that, just having it in place is huge. It's it's kind of like, you know, writing down your list of things and, and just knowing, okay, I, I, I put it down. Having having that plan in place helps, at least it does for me, and I've seen this for other business, and it helps you sleep better yeah. at night, so. Absolutely. All right, Pete. Well, I was telling Tom as we we're getting ready for this webinar today, it's a, the pre-chat in the room. I said, hey, I'm I'm actually looking at my forecast here. Uh, 
<laughs> dig into the forecast. It's much along the lines of what Tom said. And, and here's, here's why I think that's important. Arguably, I'm a personal finance genius. Arguably, arguably. Uh, <laughs> co corporate finance? No, no, I'm not. I need help. So I have a fraction CFO. Like I need, I need help. So as a business owner, I think one of the, the things you can do is to stop saying, well, who knows? You never know. I mean, it's the unknown. We'll just see what happens. Stop. Yeah. You, you can know. You can make really informed projections and forecasts. It has changed my outlook on my business. It's built confidence in my ability to understand corporate finance. And that excuse of, well, hey, you never know. That's garbage. I mean, you can know, and it's just putting in the work. Well yeah, said. absolutely. Knowledge is power here, right? Especially when you're using that that information, that data to drive decision making, right? Which is is what we're we're all about. So, all right. So let's take a couple of minutes here. I'll look at some of the questions that that have come in and see if we can how many of those we can address in our remaining uh, remaining time. So. The first one, um, how would you tailor the advice for a nonprofit? Tom, uh, do you have any thoughts on this one? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, we work with a lot of nonprofit organizations, and I would say that most of the fundamentals are the same, uh, but one way fundamentally that a nonprofit is different than a for-profit is in their use of a board. Most nonprofits have a full functioning board, so um, the board is going to usually require that the executive director or the or executive director of the management team have a contingency plan. So the advice I gave earlier about preparing a trigger-based contingency works particularly well with a, a nonprofit. But probably more importantly, the second piece of advice I'd give for nonprofits is to leverage your board during tough economic times. Um, board members of nonprofit organizations are often made up of very savvy, well-connected business leaders that can help, right? So Ask them to get involved. Uh, ask them to get involved in, in fundraising conversations. Ask them for advice when it comes to expense reduction. Odds are they've been through this, right? And they they can be very helpful to you. Ask them for help in soliciting volunteers, you know, doing more with less. Leverage your board. Uh, boards offer a wealth of experience and talent, and you need to take advantage of it. Yeah, I I love that. I just want to add I the the idea of of asking for help. People who have gone through this, if this is the first time you've experienced it, there's so many things that that we, are new for all of us that we're we're going to find out. So just taking advantage of people in your network, people that you know that have information, I think is a, a key to being able to get through a, a difficult time. Uh, Pete, anything that you wanted to add to that one? Actually, yes. Um, I, I probably, <laughs> you know, nonprofits have this really unknown advantage when it comes to financial wellness. Uh, there's a program called Public Service Loan Forgiveness that most nonprofits employees qualify for. That is to say, if you're a nonprofit leader, uh, you can get your student loans of your people wiped out. And so that is uh, very valuable yeah. as you're trying to look a person in the eye and say, hey, what do, what, what do you say we increase your net worth by six figures over the next couple of months? That's a big deal. Yeah, that is fantastic. Uh, no, that, that's great. Yeah. So let's see, there's a question about the recession and what that does to the job market. Oh, goodness. Well, I will I will start um, with this one. I, I think that really anything can happen at any time, as we have learned just from seeing the job market over the last few years. I'd say in general, workers are more likely to stay put. Um, it's just harder to find something new when people aren't hiring as much. Um, they're willing to stick around, I think, a bit a bit longer. But with that being said top performers are going to become even more attractive. And I think there's a good chance of, of competitors coming after your top talent. There's such a, such a draw there. So it's worth the time to identify your risks, the, the people, the positions, what, where are you at risk? Um, work on building your pipelines and succession planning. I am a big believer that it doesn't matter the size of your organization put some thought into succession planning. What would happen if, right? Think through those. It's it's people-based scenarios as opposed to the um, the financial scenario. So thinking through that as well. I would also say that budgets tend to be a lot tighter, right? We don't have as much to spend on recruiting efforts. Um, so you might need to get a little creative with your recruiting strategy. I think that, that this is something you, again, can prepare for by making sure that you are tracking your spend. Get the data. 
right? What, what resources are successful? Where am I finding my best candidates? So that when you do need to really cut down on your budget, you can have the most impact with your recruiting spend by focusing it on the places that are the most beneficial to you. Um, the only other thing that, that comes to mind it, just related to recruiting in a recession, um, think about employee referrals. If you don't do an employee referral bonus, it can be a great way to both, you know, get that bonus, something additional for your team, but also it can open up new candidates. Um, it, it just it introduces you to people you might not otherwise have been able to, to discover. All right, a um, couple more that we have time for here. Uh, let's see. Oh, in, Tom, this is for you. In preparing a contingency plan, how do you identify the triggers? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and you really have to find the triggers that make sense for your business. So I, I, I mentioned before that um, you want to find the leading indicators if possible. So I'll give you an example. So in our business, the health of the pipeline is a really good leading indicator. Um, so when I'm when I'm looking at, you know, are we about to go through tough times? I'm looking at things like the size of the pipeline. So what is our monthly recurring revenue that's in the pipeline now versus what it's been over the last, you know, trending over the last several months? Or what's our close rate? So if our close rate has historically been at, you know, 50% and it's dropping to 30%, that's a sign that, tough times are ahead, right? Or maybe it's the closed cycle. You know, maybe it's taking longer to get to a decision. What used to happen in 30 days is now extending to 90 days to get to a yes or a no, right? So understanding what the leading indicators are in your business and walk, watching those, that's, to me, that's a really good trigger to help you, that's, you know, start to cut. That, that's great. Um, Pete, I'd like to start with you on this one if you're if you're comfortable here um as a business owner how can you be transparent with your team about the hardships a recession might bring without unnecessarily caught scaring them or causing panic when i think about this i think about kindness i think it is kind to be transparent uh i think mm -hmm. you know i read something the other day that sometimes business owners or leaders focus too much on being nice and not enough about being kind and um, yeah. if you think about treating someone as you wish to be treated, you would want that information so they can make the decisions they need to make. And so it's not always fun. I mean, that's the nature of leadership. That's why leaders are constantly reading books about how to deliver uncomfortable information <laughs> because it's the kind thing to do. And so doesn't always go well, isn't always easy, but I, I think it's about the motivation. Sometimes we, we, again, altruism and pragmatism have this strange relationship in business. It, something can both be the right thing to do and also be pragmatic. And I think this is one of those scenarios. Yeah, no, I, that's great. Uh, Tom, anything that, that you would want to add to that? Well, first of all, I love that. That was really well said. Um, I would just say, you know, treat your employees like adults, right? In the, in the absence of, of information, they're going to imagine scenarios. They're going to make up scenarios that are likely much worse than what's actually happening. So, you know, yeah. just talk, share your plan, have a town hall style meeting if it makes sense for your team and it fits your culture. culture. But I believe that trust is built by being honest and transparent with your team. So in good times and bad. Yeah, absolutely. And, and honestly, if you do have to make those difficult decisions, if things happen, it, it's and it comes out of nowhere, right? Because we've we've painted this rosy image, it, it, that's even more difficult, I, I think, for the team. So, all right, we have time for one last question, Pete. I am going to send this to you and let you take our last question today. How do we know when a recession is over and we can breathe again? I mean, Don't you love that question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Technically, when the economy starts to grow again, as opposed to contract, but you know, I don't know. I, I think each business is a little bit different. Um, now, I am a member of the media. Uh, I, I, I have to state, but sometimes the media will perpetuate this idea that things are are worse than they really are. So, knowing the data, knowing how your actuals and your forecasts are lining up, keeping an eye on that is, is a good way to go. But I sort of view, you know, tough news through the media like this. 
We've all unfortunately been in one of those scenarios in which we've had a friend in our personal life going through a relationship transition, which is the nice way we say divorce now, right? So we all have a friend who has been through that. And when you're a married person and you witness that, you go to your spouse and you look at them and you go, we're okay, right? You okay? We're okay, okay. And everyone's okay. <laughs> I think in, in, in business, you got to do that too. You're, you're told everything's going to stink and you go, okay, this is hard to deal. Are we okay? And you go to leadership. Okay. 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 We're fine. Let's go. And, and I think in a recession, business leaders have to do that. They have to be a little more qualitative and say, okay, are we good? Let's go. And so I think you get to call the end of the recession yourself. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, I am going to, on that note, call the end of the webinar myself. Um, we are at time, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thank you so much to Pete. Thank you, Tom, uh, for joining us today. I know this is a, a very relevant and timely topic, and I'm just excited that we were able to take this time to chat about it. So uh, everyone, on behalf of Pete, Tom, and myself, thank you so much for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.